Go ahead and get started. Um, I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel on LGBTQ rights and public policy and health. And we have three fabulous speakers today. Um, Christopher Lowe Records, Amy Alterman, and Amanda Walner. I'll introduce the speakers one at a time and um, so we can all see each other's presentations. We'll sit in the audience and then there'll be some time for Q&A. Um, I think, why don't we save Q&A for the end of the, the panel, um, and then you can ask individual questions of the speakers if you'd like, or we can have more of a discussion. It's a nice small group, so we can um, make the most of that. So um, Christopher's talk is A Strong Sense of Panic, an Analysis of 35 Gay and Trans Panic Defenses. So welcome, Christopher. Hi. Um, my name is Chris Lowe Records. I'm a third year public policy student at USC. Um, today I'm going to be talking about gay and trans panic defenses with a focus on filling the gap in understanding that we have on the exact incidence of those defenses. And um, I'll also be talking about some common trends across the cases. So on October 3rd, 2002, Gwen Araujo was murdered in Newark, California by Michael Magidson, Jose Morel, Jaron Neighbors, and Jason Cazares. The men tortured her for several hours, punching and choking her, striking her with their fists, a frying pan, and other objects, before beating her to death with a shovel. At trial, the four men aimed for a conviction of manslaughter rather than murder. Two of them had engaged in sexual relations with Araujo and claimed that they had experienced a strong sense of panic upon discovering that she was a trans woman. The defense resulted in this case in a hung jury and a retrial, at the end of which two of Araujo's killers were convicted of second degree murder and two pled guilty to manslaughter. Cases like Araujo's, horrifically brutal, high profile, and in the news, focused attention over the course of the last 20 years on the use of gay and trans panic defenses in the courtroom to justify violence and reduce penalties for perpetrators. This increased attention in a number of high profile cases, resulted in the passage of the first and only law on the books in any state prohibiting the use of these defenses, California Assembly Bill 2501, which was passed last December. Uh, it specifically states, this bill would state that for purposes of determining sudden quarrel or heat of passion, the provocation was not objectively reasonable if it resulted from the discovery of knowledge about or potential discovery, uh, disclosure of the victim's actual or perceived gender, gender identity, gender expression, or sexual orientation, including under circumstances in which the victim made an unwanted, non-forcible, romantic, or sexual advance toward the defendant, or if the defendant and victim dated and had a romantic or sexual relationship. Now, just to provide some context, in the winter of 2014, as this bill was making its way through the legislature, I was working as an intern with one of its sponsoring organizations, Equality California. My role as an intern was essentially to prepare briefs for legislators and for the press so that they didn't have to actually read uh, through the full text of bills um, and journal articles. In the context of AB 2501, the challenge was a little bit different. The bill targeted court cases in which gay and transpanic defenses were employed, but nobody had any idea of the exact number of those cases uh, in the past 20, 30, 50 years. All they had were a half dozen or so uh, high profile cases, including Gwen Araujo's, Matthew Shepard's, and a couple of others that have uh, really dominated the news in the last 20 years. My task then was to find as many of these cases as possible and to provide detail on the facts. Doing this required me to look through a couple hundred editions of national and local newspapers, uh, including publications as diverse as Vanity Fair and the Waterfo Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier. The list that I came up with uh, has about 35 cases in it from 1986 to 2001. It is by no means comprehensive given the decentralized nature of courts in this country. It, there is no w easy way to come up with a comprehensive list of these cases. 35 merely represent those cases that attracted significant news attention. So what exactly is a panic defense? A 
Panic defense is a strategy employed at a trial for murder that seeks to justify the killer's actions by arguing that he was provoked or was rendered incapable of acting rationally by the sexual aggressiveness or deception of his victim. In the case of deception, it's, it's sexual orientation that's being con or gender identity that's being concealed. The idea of a homosexual panic originates in psychological research in the 1920s, but it was not employed at trial until the late 1960s. First case, People v. Rodriguez, happened in 1967, established the basic pattern of homosexual uh, panic murder defenses in those early years with the defendant arguing that the sexual advances of the victim had caused him to temporarily panic and act aggressively. In other words, it was a temporary insanity strategy. This approach was further refined in cases such as People v. Parisi, in which the defense team called a number of expert witnesses to testify that the defendant was a latent homosexual who had killed his victim because of homosexual panic disorder. In recent years, the use of homosexual panic as part of a temporary insanity strategy has decreased. Insanity defenses are increasingly rare. In California, they make up less than 1% of all pleas, and they're only successful maybe half of the time. Nationwide, it's also 1%, um, but the success rate there is lower, 30%. Most recent cases have used gay panic or trans panic justifications as part of a provocation or heat of passion argument. These arguments, used in cases such as Arajo's, seek to reduce the severity of convictions, usually from second degree murder to manslaughter, by arguing that the defendant experienced emotional distress in response to a sexual provocation on the part of the victim, and that his ability to act rationally was compromised as a result. In cases such as Arajo's, the strategy has been remarkably successful. Several other cases have used gay panic uh, defenses as part of a slightly different self-defense strategy, alleging that the victim's sexual advances toward the defendant were aggressive and threatening and merited aggressive action in response. So just to recap, okay. Oop. There are three main buckets with these defenses, temporary insanity, provocation, and self-defense with the last two most common in the last 25 years. So gay panic and trans panic defenses play on existing anti-LGBT biases and on existing perceptions that LGBT crime victims to a certain extent deserve what's coming to them by provoking violence. Defenses play on this bias, emphasizing the sexuality of the victim and the embarrassment or shock of the killer at being the object of a sudden same-sex sexual attraction. In trans panic defenses, such as Guanarajos, this is paired with an emphasis on the deception of the victim, with the defense arguing that the discovery of the victim's concealed gender identity instigated an overwhelming violent response. So 35 cases, I'm not going to be able to detail all of them, but I'm going to go through three examples that are lesser, lesser well known than cases like Arajos or Matthew Shepard's. So. First case I'm going to describe is the trial of Richard Lee Bednarski, 18, for the murder of Tommy Lee Trimble, 34, and John Lloyd Griffin, 27, in May 1988 in Dallas. Bednarski approached the two men in their car on the night of the murder. He'd been known to do this on occasion in a custom called gay bashing, uh, in which high school boys, specifically from his high school, would go to known high traffic gay areas of Dallas and then harass and beat up people. So he entered the car with a friend. They uh, drove to a deserted area of the Reverchon Park area of Dallas. Benarski then asked the two men to strip. They refused, at which point he shot them both. Trimble died on the spot. Griffin died five days later. At trial, Benarski's lawyers claimed that Trimble and Griffin had solicited him for sex. The jury convicted him of murder anyway, but he then elected to have the judge in the case decide the sentence, which is allowed under Texas law. The judge chose to sentence him to 30 years rather than life and explained in a quote that was reprinted in news reports, I put prostitutes and gays at about the same level and I'd be hard put to, put, uh, to give somebody life for killing a prostitute. So. 
Second case is the murder of Kenneth Brewer by Stephen Bright. Brewer, 58, met Bright, 30, at a gay bar on the night of his death. They went back to Brewer's apartment, at which point Bright said that Brewer made an aggressive sexual advance. He then proceeded to beat Brewer to death. At trial, the prosecutors presented significant evidence against Bright's self-defense argument, in particular, evidence of blood residue on the inside of his pants, suggesting that he had taken them off prior to killing Brewer. Uh, in any case, he claimed self-defense at trial and that he had murdered Brewer in a panic state. He was convicted of third-degree assault rather than murder and was released on time served a month after the trial was concluded. Oh. And I don't have a picture for number three. but The last is the August 15, 2004 murder of Fresno, California trans woman Joel Robles. That's the name that's provided in news reports, just FYI. Uh, by Estanislao Martinez. Robles and Martinez had met and had some form of sexual contact at her apartment. Martinez stabbed her 20 times with a pair of scissors when he discovered she was transgender, and he claimed a transpanic defense at trial. His lawyer said, the decedent represented herself to be female. She, he, that's his pronoun use, said he was female to him. There was some sexual activity that occurred, all under the impression that Mr. Martinez was engaging in sexual activity with a woman. He further explained that the killer experienced a rage that didn't justify the conduct, but excuses it to a certain degree, and therefore it is not murder. Uh, as part of that, at the end of the trial, uh, Martinez was offered a plea deal and pled guilty to manslaughter. He was sentenced to four years in prison. This not particularly clear chart shows uh, an overview of all the cases that I looked at. Um, two major points with these cases, uh, two major trends. First is the high success rate. So um, of the 31 cases detailed, the defenses resulted in reduced conviction or acquittal more, uh, approximately 50% of the time, 47%. Of the five transpanic defenses, four of those were successful. Um, obviously, it's a small sample size, so I can't really draw trends across that. Second, of the 27 gay panic defenses detailed, all but one involved killers who were younger than uh, the victim at the time of the murder. Of those same cases, 22 victims were older than 30. The average age of the killer in these cases was 22 years and the average age of the victim was 42 years. The opposite trend appears in the five transpanic cases. In these cases, all but one of the killers was older than the victim. The average age of the killer in these cases, 28. The average age of the victim, 21. So what does this all mean, and what can we do about it? Uh, core lesson is that anti-LGBT bias on the part of juries and judges can be successfully exploited by smart defense attorneys to affect better outcomes for their clients. A narrative of predatory sexuality, deception, youth being exploited by older men, that's a winning strategy at trial. It worked in 1986 and earlier than that, and it's worked as late as 2011, which was the last case that I looked at. Um, so the 30 five cases that I looked at are uh, shockingly brutal. They're uh, pretty much a catalog of horrors. Deaths by bludgeoning, stabbing, shooting, burning, and burial alive. Uh, deaths involving murder weapons as various as tire irons, ropes, shovels, guns, knives, and axes. In spite of that common brutality, a significant portion of the perpetrators of such murders are able to ex uh, escape harsher punishments for their crimes by drawing attention to the sexual orientation and gender identity of their victims. To prevent such outcomes, we need legislative action across states, such as California AB 2501, to disallow the use of those defenses in court. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm going to have to remind myself of that. It was... I, so a good portion of the cases that I looked at, probably more than seven were in California. You would think that they're localized to one particular area of the country, maybe the south, the Midwest, um, and they're not. They're actually very widely distributed across the country. Um, there were other cases after 2011 that I looked at, but they were still in the process of going through um, trials. So I, I stopped it at 2011. But there were two or three cases that were reported in the news in 2013 and 2014 um, that were also, uh, where they were also employing this sort of a strategy. I th in, in all of the cases that I looked at, or in, uh, uh, I'm not going to say all, but um, the vast majority, the sole, the, there, was, there was not hate crimes charge accompanying um, the murder charge. Uh, every, every single case, it was a it was a male perpetrator. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, did we have time? It's just yeah. a quick one. I'm wondering, did you find any correlation between the race of the victim and the success of the panic? In the vast majority of these cases, with the exception of one, which is actually a, a fairly surprising case, it was uh, that was the 2011 one, uh, which was. Uh, the murder of a, a man in his 60s in Mississippi. He's a white supremacist. He's actually a KKK grand wizard. The victim was, and he was murdered um, by a African American younger man. Um, that was not a successful strategy for him at, at trial. But uh, there were no uh, racial, no particular racial trends that I saw um, between you know, victim and killer. Next up, we have Amy Alterman, who is going to be giving a talk that's a little bit different than what's listed in the program, so I'll read the title. Homage to Esther Newton, One Lesbian Researcher's Autoethnographic Journey Toward LGBTQ Inclusive Sex Education in Atlanta, Georgia. So, Amy. Thank you. So first I want to acknowledge just some of the kind of serious and upsetting things that we all just heard and maybe take a breath. I know I need one. Um, and to let you know, I am really shifting the energy with this, with this paper. So, um, so please come on this ride with me. Um, it is still related to policy and I'm happy to answer policy specific questions also during the Q&A but this specific presentation does not focus primarily on policy. Okay, so, <clears throat> oh, maybe I'll lift this a bit. So picture this. I'm sitting in my mother's house in suburban Georgia, just down the street from my old high school. It's 2 p.m. and I'm camped out in front of my laptop still wearing my pajamas. I've been in Georgia for two and a half weeks thus far. I've spent the past month trying to speak to key people about sex education implementation there. Up to this point, as you could probably tell by the pajamas, I had only been mildly successful. With three pro-sex ed conversations under my belt, I've interviewed a good friend who is a high school teacher, a friend of a friend who used to work for the governor, and unfortunately this interview was anonymous, of course, um, and staffers of the state's premier comprehensive sex education nonprofit. 
But amongst my countless emails, voicemails, and resurrect resurrected networks of friends and family members, I've, only, I've been unable to secure an interview with anyone who is actually opposed to comprehensive sex education, who would speak in support of the abstinence-centered and abstinence-only sex education curricula that are prevalent in Georgia today. So I'm sitting there in the pajamas and I'm anxiously awaiting a confirmation email that I've been hoping to get since I began this research because it will get my foot in the door with abstinence sex education advocates when the following email arrives in my inbox. Hi Amy, it was a pleasure speaking with you briefly yesterday as well. I've actually been thinking quite a bit about this interview and have done some research of my own. Ooh, what does she know about me? And now, after reading through the consent form, I realize that I'm not the best candidate to participate in your study due to your study's focus on comprehensive sex education, dot, dot, dot. Given that we are on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of our views, I just think I would prove a complete waste of your time. Then she makes some helpful suggestions. Um, thank you for understanding. Sincerely, Veronica. I'm frustrated and very let down. How am I supposed to get a clear picture of sex education implementation in Georgia if no one who advocates for abstinence will speak with me? Why is abstinence only education pervasive if its most ardent supporters remain silent? And what about her turning the research tables on me? What did she find out that made her unwilling to speak with me? Veronica is, Veronica is the assistant of a well-known abstinence-centered motivational speaker who refused to speak with me or allow me to attend any of her events, even if I got permission from the principal, et cetera, et cetera. When Veronica relayed this message from the speaker, I asked, well, what about you? Will you speak with me about sex education? Then probably out of guilt, or maybe because I asked nicely, she reluctantly agreed to speak with me for, quote, 15 minutes in the carpool line. I was gleeful. I sent her an email immediately with my consent form and appreciating our conversation. I'm so excited. And then I received this email response, the, the one that you just saw. So obtaining quotes to later discredit and deconstruct was my, not my intent in this research. My desire to speak to opponents of comprehensive sex education was fueled by the urge to engage in a reflective discourse on the current state of sex education in Atlanta as it's practiced. In my application for the UCLA Summer Graduate Research Mentorship, I argue that a more accurate impression of current attitudes towards sex ed in Georgia would allow me to propose a path forward and help generate collaborative solutions towards comprehensive sex education. My initial pro-sex informant shared a general sentiment that there were a slew of opponents and specific gatekeepers to be understood and assuaged. They expressed an uncertainty or reluctance to share who these actual individuals were, however but a certainty that these individuals would most definitely decline to speak with me. My failure to speak with anyone who would not generally be considered an advocate of comprehensive sex education was my primary failure in the field, and it was weighing on me. And this reminds me, the last panel we were talking about, failure as a tool. My identity felt intricately wound up in my interactions with people and in my findings. Feeling defeated, I started to question whether my research meth methods were really working, and if my identity as a feminist lesbian was getting in the way of my work. Even if I kept my lesbian enthusiasm in the closet, which I thought I did, was it me the lesbian or was it me the comprehensive sex educator from UCLA that fueled such reluctance to speak? Or was it conversations about sex in general that people didn't want to respond to, especially when it involved adolescents at their schools? Were all of my previously mentioned identities visible, or was my line of reflexive questioning an internalized homophobic fear based on my closeted childhood, adolescence in Georgia? Additionally, if these identities were not visible, should they be made visible in certain conversations with advocates? Would that even be productive? As a researcher, I tell my stories in the field as a political act and as an analytic tool. My own personal identity is steeped in my research topic. I look towards autoethnography to place myself solidly in the frame of analysis of my research. Professional storyteller and author Heather Forrest defines autoethnography as a creative writing process that can also be a, quote, form of arts-based inquiry, end quote. She asserts that, quote, through the artistic process of reflective writing that sense-making, new knowledge, and insight emerge, end quote. 
She elaborates that, quote, telling stories and being aware of the powerful forces at play in storied interactions is a creatively charged social, education, educational, and political act, end quote. I find Forrest's definition particularly helpful and use my own stories and reflections in order to make sense of my current networks of communication surrounding comprehensive sex education and as a springboard for further questioning in my own writing and right now in this performance. Um, I am a sex education, educator and researcher. I specifically look at how the arts, personal narrative, and humor can be used for sex education initiatives. One of the main reasons I do what I do leads back to that small suburb in Atlanta, Georgia, of Atlanta, Georgia. I remember sitting in a classroom, my face heating up, as the guest speaker awkwardly spoke about how easy and freeing it was to become a, quote, born-again virgin, end quote. That was the extent of my sex education. Thinking back on the uncomfortable and stigmatizing moments of my sex education experience in the context of everything I learned about sex after that point, from my gender studies minor to the vagina monologues to working as a sex educator for the feminist-owned sex toy store in New York, Babeland, I am deeply motivated to contribute to comprehensive LGBTQ inclusive sex education curricula for young people everywhere. Comprehensive sex education is sex education that uses a holistic approach to provide people with medically accurate, inclusive, diverse, and thorough information about sexual health and sexual reproduction. Influenced by the Sexual Education Information and Education Council of the United States, acronym CECAS, um, my definition of comprehensive sex education encompasses LGBTQ inclusivity, which I define as material that addresses the sexual education and health needs of LGBTQ people. LGBTQ inclusivity incorporates language and examples that feature and specifically name LGBTQ people. For my research, my goal was to get a profile of attitudes on comprehensive sex education implementation with a particular interest in current attitudes and practices surrounding the LGBTQ inclusive component of comprehensive sex education and the current policies. I am not the only person who considers LGBTQ inclusion an important component of comprehensive sex education. In fact, in the first week of October, California Governor Jerry Brown signed AB 329, which I followed, uh, which mandates that comprehensive and LGBT inclusive sex education be taught in public California middle and high schools. And California is not the only, some snaps for that, right? <laughs> and California is not the only state on board. Nine other states require positive LGBTQ inclusive messaging as a part of their sex education curricula. Unfortunately, and maybe not to the surprise of many of you, Georgia is not one of those states. As I referenced at the beginning of this presentation, after five weeks, I didn't have much luck with anyone outside of my realm of allied organizations. My process of receiving rejection or silence to many inquiries reminded me of Esther Newton's experience as a lesbian anthropologist in Too Queer for College. In this essay, she describes a series of rejections, most of which are unsaid rejections. She describes rejections based on, quote, phony standards and, quote, personality differences. Through these trials, she affirms that she had, quote, found a voice in the silence society tried to impose on me, end quote. In silence, she discovered the ability to analyze the traces of discrimination surrounding differences in gender and sexuality and to theorize how social structures were working in the United States. She was also inspired to celebrate uh, to highlight and celebrate gay cultures and anthropology, giving them visibility. Unlike Newton, I'm not sure that I'm visible as a lesbian in the field, but I do think that my own perceptions of this are useful, and I'm sure that my subject matter is. Even with my interviews with professionals from allied organizations, I immediately sense some nervousness around the topic of LGBTQ inclusivity. For example, when I asked the CEO of a major sex education advocacy organization in Georgia about how her organization approached LGBTQ inclusive sex ed, she responded, um, she responded that it was part of their work, but that she, quote, didn't really know. When I asked two of the CEO's staff members who work directly with Georgia teachers and schools, I didn't feel that I gained more insight about what they were specifically doing in order to create more LGBTQ inclusive sex education spaces. One offer that LGBTQ inclusive sex ed was really important, but that she didn't know much about it. Instead of sending me to someone else in her organization, she sent me to a different organization entirely, an organization that some might refer to as a gay organization, Georgia Equality. This was particularly troubling to me because 
Uh, Atlanta has the highest rate of, uh, has the sixth highest rate of youth uh, HIV transmission, and young men who have sex with men are disproportionately affected six times more likely, uh, young men of color who have sex with men are six times more likely than white men in Atlanta uh, to, to transmit HIV. <clears throat> when she gave me this uh, reference to Georgia Equality, I was grateful because I understood she was trying to be helpful, but I was concerned that no one from Georgia's premier and actually only comprehensive sex education organization could speak to LGBTQ inclusivity in the sex education classroom in a specific way. When I spoke with the second staffer, I used a slightly different approach to gauge the organization's involvement with LGBTQ inclusive work by asking him whether he thinks LGBTQ inclusive sex education should be mandated in the state like it currently is in California. When asked this question, he said, are there gay people who are prejudiced towards people because they are lesbian, bisexual, gay, queer, transgender? Absolutely. And for those people, Things need to be done to try and convince them, hey, this is not the way to be, that's wrong. But on the flip side of that, there is some responsibility from some of the actions of people within that particular community that have made other people look at them and go, if you're not respecting yourself and you're not respecting me, you expect me to respect your rights? There has to be more respect on both sides of the situation, he says. Significantly, this was the informant with whom I ultimately built the closest relationship. He graciously met with me several times, provided relevant and honest information, and processed questions with me instead of simply dismissing them or sending me somewhere else. However, as a lesbian researcher most interested in LGBTQ inclusivity and sex education, I was shocked and a bit heartbroken by his answer. I think the most striking part of his reply is his failure to describe the disrespectful behavior that she mentions. I realize now that I should have asked him specifically what he meant by, quote, disrespectful behavior, end quote. However, during this part of the interview, I had a knot in my stomach. I just wanted it to be over. I thought, I must reduce my urge to address this way of thinking or I'll completely make myself vulnerable in an unprofessional and unproductive way. Looking back at my field notes the day after the interview, I wrote, it will be interesting to revisit what was actually said as I feel like my mind was racing at this point. In these moments, I wanna have a conversation that sheds light on how problematic what they're saying is and how that's affecting youth. Yet, at someone working in the field, I need to keep my judgment in check. I'm starting to feel guilty about these moments because they're the ones that I think I'm going to completely deconstruct and use to examine larger issues. Yet, these people are being so generous with me, and they're going to read my results. Reflexively, I can't help but wonder if I avoided addressing some of these comments because I knew it would be difficult to speak about these issues unemotionally, or maybe because I was afraid it would out me and negatively affect the researcher and format relationship. Perhaps to best expand upon my predicament as a lesbian researcher, I can look to Newton's my best informant stress, the erotic, the erotic not aquatic, that would be quite an interesting essay as well, um, the erotic equation in fieldwork. In this essay, she explores the historically unspoken by women and queer people, eroticism between field worker and informant. She says, if straight men choose not to explore how their sexuality and gender may affect their perspective, privilege, and power in the field, women and gays, less, critical, less credible by definition, are suspended between our urgent sense of difference and our justifiable fear of revealing it. Asking informants questions about LGBTQ inclusion, I felt this every moment. I wondered, do they know I'm gay? Is that why they're confirming the importance of the question but dismissing any type of possible answer? By recognizing my own possible internalized homophobia, I take Newton's advice when she says, quote, as the issues crystallize out of history, anthropologists must begin to acknowledge eroticism our own and that of others if we are to reflect on the meaning for our work and perhaps help other cultural systems for the better. So what does all of this mean? From silence to dismissal to deflection, I found that many of our staunchest allies in Georgia just aren't ready to discuss LGBTQ inclusive education. And many aren't ready to discuss abstinence only or comprehensive such education either. 
Perhaps my own feelings of nervousness and my inclination to keep my own sexuality out of my professional capacity, even when related, reflects a greater trend of many Atlantans. The safety and security of keeping a once very stigmatized, and now I would argue significantly less so, identity out of the realm of our livelihoods. But more importantly, what are the costs? In the introduction to Newton's collection of essays, Margaret Mead Made Me Gay, Judith Halperstam writes, quote, we have to confront medical opinion and mainstream doctrines of pathology, and only then can we identify the vibrant, the vibrant vernaculars and inventive subcultures of queer lives. Although much progress has been made in LGBTQ rights liberation movements, based on my experiences in the field, I wonder how much has really changed. Is the new homophobia admitting that there's a problem in this very PC and friendly way and sending that problem in the direction of a different nonprofit bureaucracy, perhaps the gay nonprofit? Have we found the words to articulate our history of pathologization and how it can be redressed in health education environments? Now, I will leave you with an email from the Atlanta public school system where my research was supposed to be located. I received this shortly after my email from, um, from Veronica when she declined to participate in my research. And this is the email. Ms. Alterman, this is to inform you that the APS is not interested in implementing the sex education study in our district. Interesting, I didn't ask them to implement anything. Please do not contact any APS employee concerning the completion of the sex education survey. Thank you. So, as you can imagine, <laughs> this brought up some problems <laughs> in the field for me. I was in the process, I had contacted at this point several people who worked for APS. Teachers, I contacted superintendents, I contacted personal, uh, personal relationships that I had with people who knew people in APS, and I was currently filling out their very long and lengthy IRB application. And he sends me this. I responded, does this mean I absolutely cannot talk to anybody who is employed and works in the Atlanta public school system? Yes, that's what it means, thank you, was his response. So for a brief update, two weeks after I left the field, I received an email from my mother, of all people, um, containing a video clip from the Atlanta CBS News. The news clip reported in a very kind of humorous way as well. Um, I have the links if anyone is interested. <laughs> um, that a new sex ed cur curriculum, an abstinence-centered curriculum, um, was adopted by APS. So it's, uh, the current curriculum is called Choosing the Best. It's heteronormative. It's medically inaccurate. And just to give you a sense of the curriculum, uh, they compare women to, who have had sex to chewed pieces of gum. And then they ask the students, and what kind of man would want to chew a chewed piece of gum? So we have some problems on that front. And this, and this is a school district that is, is one of the most affected by HIV and STIs in the country. <clears throat> one, uh, one teacher that I interviewed told me that the choosing the best training that she attended told her that if students came with her with any questions about homosexuality at all, that she had to directly refer them to their parents or to their, quote, religious leader, end quote. And she felt frustrated by this because she felt like she could provide some kind of answer. Um, and this is about anything that's LGBTQ related. So for my own process and uh, reflecting on this field work that I've had, I'm, I'm just beginning to unpack the barriers to comprehensive sex education in Georgia and the intricacies of the networks of communication surrounding its implementation. After this last and final rejection that you see in front of you from the entire Atlanta Public School District, um, and the unpopular adoption of the Choosing the Best curriculum, it made me sit back and think. No wonder they wouldn't talk to me. Thank you. different methodologies that are being used from kind of a more um, distance legal approach to um, a very close personal ethnographic approach. Um, so our last speaker is going to 
is Amanda Wallner, who's going to present on protecting youth from institutional abuse, gaps in state and federal regulation put LGBTQ youth at risk. And Amanda is a graduate of our Luskin School of Public Affairs. Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon now. Uh, the bell kind of signified that. Uh, my name is Amanda Walner. I am the Policy and Operations Manager at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Um, and kind of similar to Christopher, this project began when I uh, had a fellowship at the center um, while I was in school at UCLA. Um, it started a little bit in the reverse, though. It started as a research project. A uh, um, few of our staff members had seen a movie on Showtime called Kidnapped for Christ. Uh, about some kids who were taken to a facility in the Dominican Republic um, to reform their bad behavior. And, and, and one of the um, youth that was profiled is a young gay man named David. And you'll actually get to see a little bit of his story. Um, and from that research, we discovered that this isn't something that's only happening in the Dominican Republic. There are actually these facilities all over the country, um, including several in California. Uh, and the, um, the regulatory framework around these institutions is severely lacking, uh, which led to the introduction of a piece of legislation here in California, um, which you know, we're hoping will be passed early in 2016, um, and also a piece, uh, the reintroduction of um, some legislation at the national level, um, which would be surprising if it passed uh, anytime soon, given the makeup of our current Congress. But um, we're still trying, and it actually does have bipartisan support. So um, this is going to be a little bit of an introduction to the troubled teen industry, um, to the issue. Uh, it's not something that I think is widely known about. Um, and with a little bit of information about the, the bills that we're working on as well. Um, so I'm actually going to skip this slide. It's a video, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. Um, so the troubled teen industry is made up of uh, several different kinds of facilities. Um, there's boot camps where kids might be sent for, you know, uh, a, a week maybe um, during the summer. There was actually a big story just over this past summer of some youth from Los Angeles who were sent to a sheriff's boot camp in San Luis Obispo. Um, the, uh, the employees there who were running the boot camp uh, broke one of the kids' arms. Uh, they, they were you know, required to do a lot of phys physically strenuous activities. Um, there is no oversight over these, these camps. Uh, so that, that's one of the kinds of facilities we're talking about. We're also talking about wilderness camps. Um, these, this is where you know your family sends you off to the desert of Utah for an entire summer, maybe, um, and you go and you you know discover yourself. And there have been many cases of youth dying in these programs because, again, um, the uh, the staff is completely unlicensed. Um, a lot of times, it's made up of you know. 20 year old kids who maybe graduated from this wilderness camp and that's really the only experience that they have and so you know they're they're not necessarily provided with warm enough clothing for the cold nights they're not necessarily provided with enough water for the hot days um, there's also behavior modification programs uh, therapeutic boarding schools so um, not like hogwarts but like a boarding school that you go to and um, you are taught like a really awful curriculum, probably pretty similar to uh, <laughs> the one described in Atlanta, um, which is, you know, you know, talks about like humans and dinosaurs, like walking the earth together. Um, and where they also, <laughs> they also will, um, you know, implement a lot of these, uh, a lot of therapies um, that, are not evidence-based that try to um, cure youth of, you know, their sexual orientation or um, re-victimize victims of sexual abuse um, in, in a lot of cases, and it's really, really terrible. 
Um, two other kind of parts of this industry are educational consultants who, um, you know, offer their services to parents who, if you type in, you know, I'm having my, you know, I don't know what to do about my kid, all these educational consultant websites pop up. They're often paid by these schools to refer kids to them um, without really any oversight as well. Um, and then teen transport services, which you'll hear a little bit about in this next video clip. Um, but for parents whose kids don't want to go to these programs for some reason, um, they hire, you know, some, uh, some, you know, ex police officers to come in the middle of the night and take their kid to these facilities. Um, so here's some youth talking about this experience. Maybe. Is it not working? Okay. One morning I woke up, two guys were at my house. They were woken up at six o'clock in the morning with escorts telling them, you know, they had five minutes to leave. And they were just like, hi, Chai, you need to wake up and put clothes on. You're going to a school in the Dominican Republic. And I was like, I don't think so. Both my parents were standing there, you know, saying, we love you, David, we love you. I was like, well, what's going on? And I was, I was, of course, I was like, you know, that's not going to happen. How could that happen to me? I'm staying here. And they're like, no, you have no choice. You can do this the easy way or the hard way. They tied a belt around my waist, um, dragged me with a belt to their car. We left on Tuesday morning and uh, left the house about 8 o'clock, got here about 11 at night. We went through the airport, they dragging me with a belt the entire time, um, flew down to Miami, and then I finally figured out where we were going. And then you'll hear a little bit more about David's story here. Basically, I got sent down here because um, my parents and I didn't get along at all. Um, I am gay, and um, my parents, they, they just weren't okay with that. They weren't willing to accept that fact. My mom said something along the lines of, I could never love a gay son. And um, they were just basically finding any way possible to you know fix the problem, change it, and I was just always felt like I was rejected because I've always felt like it was a part of me. Um, so yeah, kind of crazy that that happens. Uh, and it happens, you know, like I said, not only in the Dominican Republic, but here in California as well. Um, one of the young people that we're working with on this case, uh, her parents did, they hired two ex-police officers in the middle of the night to take her up to a um, therapeutic boarding school in Northern California. Um, and they told her that she was going to jail and because you know they found a uh, a bong in her bedroom she was 15. um and uh and instead you know later on she found out that the reason that she was sent there was um so that she couldn't have any contact with her girlfriend um because her mom was unhappy that she came out uh and you know probably a, a Many of you have heard of um, campaigns to ban conver gay conversion therapy. Um, and that was, you know, that was implemented here in California where there is a ban on gay conversion therapy. However, facilities like the one in Northern California uh, still exist because the ban on conversion therapy applies to licensed therapists. Licensed therapists are not allowed to practice uh, therapies that claim to change someone's sexual orientation. Um, it actually doesn't cover gender identity at this point. Um, but these facilities are run by unlicensed staff, uh, often, again, often young people who are graduates of the program, uh, who have no training, and honestly pretty abysmal even high school educations um, from a lot of these schools. And they practice therapies um, like uh, no touch therapy where you know the uh, the young person that I was speaking about was put on no touch therapy because she is a lesbian she identifies as a lesbian and she was at an all-girls school and um, they said okay well you're 
not going to be able to touch anyone. You can't hug your friend. You can't, they can't put their arm around you. If anyone touches you or if you touch anyone, you will be punished. Um, and so for you know, over a month, she was uh, put on this kind of therapy uh, that, um, you know, as we know, touch is a very important part of being a human. Um, and so, so they're able to get away with doing things like this because there aren't any licensed therapists um, at these schools. And so they're not actually subjected to, um, to the uh, conversion therapy ban. Um, and this is true in a lot of other states as well. Um, and LGBT youth are, you know, uh, disproportionately impacted by this issue because they're more likely to experience parental rejection. Um, many of the programs rely on parents feeling as if they have nowhere else to turn. And so, you know, if you, this is, this is exactly the kind of place that's going to prey on a vulnerable parent who um, is, you know, if they, were at home and dealing with this, it might be completely different, but it's easier to, to ship that away. Um, and then once in the facilities, a lot of LGBT youth like, uh, like Rebecca um, experience specific discrimination, neglect, and abuse. So, you know, other examples that I've heard um, include um, masculine presenting women being forced to uh, wear dresses or bows in their hair. Um, you know, because their gender presentation is not in line with what the school would want it to be. Um, and our own research has identified many LGBT survivors. Um, and a lot of times these programs do use religious affiliations to justify their lack of regulation. Uh, and so Riverview Christian Academy is the school in Northern California that Rebecca went to. Um, on the, I don't know, it's, my left, your right side, uh, where it says oppose SB 524. That's our bill that we're running through uh, through the state right now. Um, and in in this um, hilarious uh, attack piece on the bill, you know, their main their main points of opposition are that this is taking away their religious freedom to raise their children how they would want to. Um, it, it promotes an LGBT lifestyle, um, and they're using a lot of religious arguments. And all, you know, also the other thing, you look at this, this website and you think, wow, that's beautiful. Like, look at those grounds, um, you know, and, and you don't necessarily get an indication of what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, here's what they say uh, they can help you treat. Um, rebelling against authority. Grades suddenly dropped, like disdain the family. Um, are they sleeping excessively or not enough? Uh, eating disorders. Um, are they obsessing about spending time with their friends? These are like teenage things that teenagers do. I mean, it, and then in the, in the case of, you know, is your teen obese or anorexic? If your teen has an eating disorder, they, you know, you might want to seek actual treatment rather than sending them to a place that has no actual um, therapeutic underpinnings whatsoever. Uh, and so they, it really runs the gamut of, you know, normal teenage behavior, um, LGBT kids, kids with actual disorders that should be getting treatment. And so there's really um, just a wide variety of things that they claim to treat. Uh, here's another photo of smiling kids and a beautiful landscape at, uh, in Utah, um, one of these other schools that we've, we've talked to several survivors of. Um, there's, they had the uh, web uh, blog for survivors of this particular school that they call a private prison. Um, it's not a pleasant place to be, but you would never know that by looking at this picture, which looks great. Um, I mentioned the no-touch therapy. Uh, another very common thing that they use is no-talk therapy, clothing policies. Um, like I mentioned, either being, being forced to, to wear um, clothing that you know, aligns with whatever gender they think you should be aligning with. Um, in addition to that, they also, in the winter, uh, in Northern California, this facility is in a very cold part of the state. Um, they will take away the kids' shoes as one of the 
punishments if they're worried that they might try to run away. Um, and so they have to walk around in oftentimes like flip-flops in, you know, from class to class in the middle of the winter and the, through the snow. Um, and that's really common and taking away kind of any kind of personal identification, any clothing. Um, restricted communication, they're not allowed to call their parents. They're not allowed to call their family. Um, they, their family may be able to call them, you know, once a month, once they've earned that privilege. Uh, and those communications are completely monitored by staff um, and censored, uh, same with letters. Um, there, we've heard reports of physical and sexual abuse, like the kid who had his, had his arm broken, um, forced labor. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of you know, statistics about this. This is kind of what little we do have. Um, so the Government Accountability Office uh, did a, wrote a report on these facilities um, that found uh, reports of abuse in 33 states, um, more than 1,600 employees uh, involved in those cases of abuse. Um, no centralized data collection really pointed out a lot of these problems with that, you know, we don't really know the extent of the problem because, um, because there's no regulatory framework for it. Um, here's some news stories that are associated with, uh, with these programs. So, it's, you know, it's gone largely under the radar, but every once in a while you'll, you'll see these stories crop up and, um, and that's why we started the campaign. So I'm gonna actually, I have some more information on the bill, but I, I will leave that, yeah, for, for the conversation, or for our conversation afterward. Do you mind if I show yeah, this yeah. short clip? Yeah, okay, this, yeah, so we can end with this. I worked with New Horizons Ministries from March of 1991 to April of 1994. Was there anything that you personally saw or knew was going on while you were staff that would be considered physical abuse? Um, I didn't see it, but I heard it. Especially like in the QR. Um, QR is forbidden to talk about. You're not allowed to talk about why you were there. That's not something I've never heard. I mean, I wasn't even told not to say that, but it's just one of those things that you don't say. You're in the room by yourself. You get a mattress that's about that thick, and as thick as a pillow and a blanket. You'd hear there'd be four or five big guys, staff members in there with a kid. And there's just all, like, just, you could, you just knew that the kid was being tossed around and slammed against. And this is after, you know, a kid has probably been in there for days, you know, with not even, like, a sheet, you know, to cover up with, depending on how insubordinate they were. I would say to you that we all have our perceptions. I would tell you that we are not a perfect organization and we definitely make mistakes. There are things that have happened here and that will happen here in the future that shouldn't happen. Has there ever been anything here that has taken place that we wish we could change, I would, I would have to honestly state that there has been things that have taken place. I am not going to deny that there was never any form of abuse that has happened here. Um, I think in any area of child care, there is abuse. I have heard just general incidences that have happened in the past where students were abused, you know. There's no denying that whatsoever. Um, however, a lot of the onus, I believe, also falls on the student. All right. So <laughs> on that note. <laughs> yeah, why don't the panelists come back up? Thank you. Yeah, I liked um, Amy's technique of kind of just encouraging everyone to take a deep breath. Some of these yeah. are pretty heavy topics. Um, so uh, I have some questions for the panelists, but I 
thought it might be nice to open up the floor um, for those of you in the audience first. Anyone want to ask me right off the bat? Yeah, Ryan. Um, so first, I want to give a huge shout out to me. I thought it was a really great presentation. And specifically, because I feel like I'm always constantly in the process of navigating the ways in which my identity can impact my political views, but sort of like, you know, holding that back a little bit when I'm when I'm having conversations, not necessarily within academia, but within um, folks who have who are stakeholders in the policies and uh, political discourse around white research. So my general question is, what have you learned from your experience in Georgia, and what does that mean for you for future research um, in terms of navigating your identity and your politics? Well. Um, as I kind of briefly mentioned, I thought that my identity of politics were not visible. And so in writing this paper in that process um, and, and getting the email that was like, I've done a little research of my own, um, <laughs> that made me second guess that. Um, to be honest, I'm still very much in the middle of processing that because I have um, you know, some folks that I talk with within my department that think I just need to take steps back um, because I tend to be a very theatrical person with, um, I'm a bit campy, I, you know, I, all of my emotions sit on my face whether I want them to or not and this was a process of, of really accepting that and realizing that maybe it's not always a good thing in field work. Um, and, and being reflexive about that. I think as far as, you know, next steps, I'm gonna continue to work with the, the people that I'm working with and I'm gonna think about trying to water down maybe some of my materials even more because the idea for me is I, I really want even though I don't agree with people who are advocating for abstinence only and abstinence centered sex education, I think, and maybe it's partially the optimist in me, I think that there probably, there is some good reason and there is some good intention behind it. And I think that once we have those conversations, all of us in the, in the same room, um, that that dialogue will lead to change. And the most frustrating component for me was feeling like there wasn't, I wasn't allowed a dialogue because I was on one side of it. So that doesn't really answer your question, I realize. Um, it's just kind of acknowledging that I'm continuing to think about these things and um, and, and, may, and, and, I'm, and I'm considering trying to be a little more subtle in my presentation in general. However, when it comes to something like this that I think is a life and death situation or a serious quality of life issue for many people, that, that's where I'm stuck. Because the activist in me, and um, you know, we have a lot of folks in our department that identify as arts activists, the arts activist in me feels very torn. But the anthropologist, the ethnographer, the field worker in me feels that I need to step back from that a little bit. So I'm constantly thinking about that balance. Um, and I'd, I'd love to, to chat with you more about it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question and one that I'd like to extend to the other speakers as well. Um, this idea of reflexivity and research and those of us who are LGBT identified and do research with LGBT populations often struggle with this. So how do we kind of strike that balance? Do either of you have thoughts about, about this for your own work? I mean, for me, you know, luckily like living in California, um, at least in, you know, doing legislative work and, and policy research, um, there, there's not, I think it's like very different from probably doing the research in Georgia around um, abstinence only education. I mean, you know, there are out LGBT members of, of the legislature. I mean, we had the Speaker of the Assembly the last two, you know, prior to our most recent were LGBT. Um, and you know that caucus is incredibly powerful and so i have not really had to um 
you know, deal with that tension very much. Um, I think, you know, if anything, I think it, it helps um, lend authenticity to, um, to kind of, you know, the, the cases that I'm trying to make in that setting. Um, you know, I think people can, can relate to that, whether they're LGBT or not, you know, we're getting, we're getting to a place now where um, a lot of people do have a better understanding um, and so there's, I mean, there's clearly still a lot of education to be done and there are some things that, you know, they never, you know, like, I never even thought about that. Um, but I, I haven't, I've, I've been like, I haven't really had to deal with that tension very much. What about you, Christopher? Well, I think, um, well, obviously with this where I was just reviewing news articles, it's not particularly, you know, a tense environment. Right now I'm also doing uh, interviews with, um, students who've experienced bullying in, in uh, high school settings. And in those conversations, because I'm, I'm primarily dealing with LGBT youth, it's obviously uh, tremendously important to build rapport and to build a sense of, of security. Um, and I think the fact that I'm, I'm queer you know, helps that along. Um, but yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say to all you all, great job as well. Um, wow, very powerful stuff. And uh, regarding the conversion therapy thing, I, you know, even in my youth, I guess I'm still a youth, but when I was like 16, 15, I was on the computer actually Googling conversion therapy because I was raised Catholic and like, you know, thought I needed to pray the gay way. Um, but then my next Google search was like, gay anal sex. So clearly that train of thought didn't last long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's I, really a um, good marriage of both of our topics. <laughs> 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 I wanted to ask um, Amy. So, um, wow, I really want to speak to you about all your whole experience in Georgia. But um, speaking to the fact that you felt like uh, like the implementation of like a comprehensive sex ed program was so opposed, um, what do you think about maybe bringing just the idea of it, like like a sex squad type of thing, do you think maybe that approach in which it's not more like you're trying to integrate it into their like state's curriculum, which is our end goal, but um, like maybe bringing just like a program or something for like students to experience or for like people who are like head spear, 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 spearheading um, like abstinence only programs, like for them to get a glimpse, do you think that could be an effective way to kind of like Weasel way, weasel in the comprehensive sex ed program. Yeah. So um, for folks that don't know, Zach is a is an alum of the UCLA Sex Squad, which is a radical performing arts sex education uh, group here on campus that goes to LAU uh, USD high schools and teaches about urgent topics in sexual health. It's one of the main reasons why I came to UCLA, actually. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that work. Um, we're actually trying to get, he's speaking about an arts-based, a uh, multi-intervention peer education um, approach in Georgia. It's something that's been uh, working in LA that we've been doing at the UCLA Art and Global Health Center. And one of the main reasons of my interest in Georgia besides uh, it's where I grew up and the current health statistics uh, for teens specifically in this area, but also we've been trying to get the AMP program in Georgia. Um, but we've met a lot of resistance. So part of my formative research was also figuring out what was that resistance about. Um, considering I wasn't even able to talk to people from schools about the current state of education, and I very specifically phrased it that way, um, it makes sense to me that the UCLA sex squad has had trouble. Yeah. Um, there have been some ideas about maybe changing the name to the, um, and Emory tr tried it, the Sex Ed Squad. Um, and we are partnering with different nonprofits there who already have relationships, but it's, it's a complex issue um, to navigate around all the current politics. Yeah. Um, especially when, in my opinion, you know, the, the premier nonprofit isn't really taking a strong stance on some of these issues. Um, so, but that's something that I'm actively thinking through is how could we get kind of these arts-based components into current curriculum. Yeah. But every, 
I mean, but it's evidence-based and a lot of teachers, you know, what's happening now is they're just having one speaker with the entire school and a gym mm -hmm. um, so they can check off the box that they've done it. So, you know, I think that there are opportunities and I'm in the process of kind of figuring out where, where they might be. So it's 12.30 and I see lunch is being served. I know people are hungry. So I think we'll wrap up this panel, but maybe something to talk about over lunch, since this was a panel on policy and, and LGBT health, is um, how policies are changed and implemented through scholarship. Um, so thinking about you know, how you can take the good work that you're doing out into communities and actually create policy change to better health and well-being for LGBT people it might be an interesting lunch conversation. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah, enjoy lunch. Thank you. Thank you.